Well, Paratosh, nothing like the present here. Tell me how you got into Target and what you've been brought in to do. And yes, um, it's uh, probably the culmination of what I've been doing. I've been working in retail analytics for 15 years. I joined Target two years ago to help mostly the digital aspect of Target with data and analytics. And in my current role, that has expanded to include all enterprise functions. That includes data, analytics, and BI. Fantastic. So. Target clearly had a few things in mind when they brought you on. So what are their pain points? What are you really spending your time doing that sort yes. of So that's all driven by the strategy that Target is pursuing, which is to better understand guests, understand their needs, and serve those needs. And where we fit into the picture is to use data and analytics to figure out what those needs are and help us serve and surface those needs. So the two themes that you'll hear me talk about uh, through this session one is personalization, and the second one is attribution, and both of them are intimately related to one another in realizing those goals. Perfect. So here's the, th here's the thing. I'm, my mind's a little bit boggled right now. You're in retail. You have multiple, multiple touch points. So give yes. me an idea of what, you, what touch points people have and how many of them you can measure and how many you can't. Yes, so just to put it in perspective, Target is uh, number two or number three retailer, depending upon how you count, $70 billion um, in revenues annually, and also been around for more than 50 years. So what we have is a number of different kinds of media spend. So like uh, the general market out there, a little bit less than 50% on what I would call traditional media, and more than 50% trending on digital media. So digital media, if we go back the last 15 years, starting from uh, search engine optimization, search engine marketing, emails, affiliate marketing, uh, and you name it, social media marketing is uh, the latest one. So lots of different touch points. Not to forget that the mobile phones and apps have just resulted into another set of touch points for our guests. Right. And of course, you have the point of sale data and a number of other things as well. Point of sale data, and certainly we do a lot of other things, like we still send out weekly circulars if you still subscribe to newspapers. I do. Yes. So. <laughs> So, so, t so this sounds like an enormous big data problem. So one of the things that um, you know, I'm familiar with from my limited experience with working with retailers is they do have a lot of data sitting in silos and a large number of people working on it. But before we even go there, like, what's this worth? Because realistically, that's a big investment for you to make. There must be an answer to that. Yes, yeah, certainly. So I think we can all take a leap of faith. Um, but what we are seeing based upon just the work around attribution, uh, what we are seeing is that there is an opportunity to improve just the marketing spend anywhere between 10 to 30%, which is a large number at our scale. So certainly that in itself makes it a worthwhile effort. But then when we add in other aspects like personalization, that pie continues to grow. So I would say definitely a worthwhile effort, although not a trivial one. Great. And what about, um, you know, in this journey, we've seen a, a journey from very simple sort of signals. We've had last click attribution from Google and so on, which is really where a lot of people started their digital journey, moved to display, then social, and now mobile. So, you know, how, how has the journey been in terms of the adjustment made? Because I, I would imagine there's a lot of legacy behaviors would be retained when these, even when these new medium come along. Yes, so I should clarify that I'm not a marketer, but I do work uh, alongside them, and I help them make better decisions through data. So yes, there are a number of uh, legacy behaviors. And the story that I like to tell is that uh, it was very common when we started from doing just overall marketing, and then we moved into segment-based marketing. And now what we are seeing is either uh, personalized marketing or more on performance media. So that journey is just a continuum that just spurs me into figuring out how we are going to continue to measure effectiveness of marketing across the board and hopefully use data and metrics to change behaviors. Perfect. So we'd love to hear an example of some legacy behaviors that you know, maybe there shouldn't be. And, and also just hear a couple of examples of what you are using this combination of personalization and attribution measurement to, to learn or to do. Absolutely. So in terms of uh, where we have opportunities, we certainly have the weekly circular that I mentioned. And uh, I wish that we can morph it so that it is more personalized and delivered in a timely fashion. There's no reason why everybody should get it on Sunday morning. It's for some people might prefer it on Friday evening. Some others might need it on Tuesday morning because that's their day off. 
So that's one place that I think we can absolutely change. But when we get into the realm of digital marketing, the huge opportunity there is in being able to measure things more accurately. So you mentioned first click attribution, last click attribution, equal click attribution. I can assure you that there is enough data and evidence to tell us that that's not the right way of doing it. Or let me put it another way, that's not the most optimal way of doing it. And if you can measure the effectiveness of every touch point and all the interactions, you would be far ahead of the game. And really the example is that I might be looking at my marketing emails at 8 a.m. in the morning, and you might be looking at it at 9 p.m. And we need to understand and really uh, equip the marketers to be able to deliver against those differences in behavior. Great. So how do you do it then? Because attribution sounds hard and the last click thing isn't working. So what do you do? And Right, so work. the recipe seems uh, somewhat simple, although I would say not trivial. So the first part of the recipe is to really understand and acknowledge that we are going to be measuring effectiveness for every transaction. So we're not saying we are going to look at campaign level. We are going to really look at every transaction that occurs, look at all the touch points that resulted into that transaction, assign attribution, which is really impact of each of those touch points, which includes the sequencing as well as the timing between all of, all of those events, and then rolling them up at a higher level so that we can report out at the right level. So that's the first part. The second part is that even though we collect a lot of data and we can do it, uh, we don't always get it right. So you should be thinking about how are you going to set up experiments, learn and iterate quickly. So that's another aspect. And the third aspect is you really have to bring to bear big data technologies and machine learning kind of techniques to make sure that you understand this impact in the right way and you can scale it and make it as much of an automated process as possible. Great. So that frankly sounds a little scary because there may be many people here who don't have the resources that Target does, but just give us an idea of what you do need in order to be able to address this. So let's start with uh, some basics. So we certainly deal with um, uh, tens of millions of people. It's fair to say that most people in the US have heard about Target, so that's about 300 million people. Uh, then we look at the amount of data that we collect. Certainly that data is in petabytes. Uh, no surprise to most of the people here. And in terms of tools and techniques, I think we've had to resort to some uh, more cutting edge tools and techniques coming out of machine learning. So yes, it takes a little bit of an effort. I would say quite a bit of an effort. We certainly have a team of at least a half dozen data scientists working on perfecting and refining these methods. And then we also need good engineering support to make it work at scale. Uh, but the good news is that this is the same platform and same data that is used for various purposes. So it's an incremental need. Um, how I would encourage you to think about it is ask the right questions. Uh, build it if you can afford it. Buy it or partner with the right parties if it makes sense. So it's not about doing it in-house versus uh, outside. It's about the opportunity of capturing this, uh, um, I guess, room for further optimization. So another big challenge for uh, Target in particular, is that you sell a lot of really different things. You have groceries, you have clothing, you have some hard goods and furniture and other things, and all of those are going to have different purchase patterns. So when you do attribution, is it one size fits all or you have to adjust it? So you have to adjust it. Uh, so I guess long story short, you want to create models that can, that can adapt to changing behaviors, not just based upon these categories, but just based upon the context that you are in as well. So for example, if you're doing a quick uh, run during the weekday, you want to get milk and a couple of other things, that has a very different dynamic than if you do a weekend shopping trip with the rest of your family and spend a lot more time trying to browse and then make purchase decisions. So we try to take all of that into account. Um, what might be helpful is if I can give you an example, and the backdrop here is that we have a lot of data, a lot of it is anonymized, a lot of it might contain identifiable information like most of the marketers are familiar with. And so what we try to do is that uh, where possible use anonymized data, uh, where we need to, we, look, uh, we ask for permission to use it for specific purposes. Uh, but the example that I wanted to uh, share with you is around a life stage where a baby goes, it transitions from liquids to having solid foods. And there are a number of guests that are interested in getting recommendations from us based upon the kind of products that we sell, based upon what other people are doing. 
to inform them. And certainly we get uh, this permission from things like baby registry and uh, some other mechanisms that we have. But more importantly, if you think about this, this is more of a personalized experience. And you could imagine a world where you could share additional information. For example, if a baby or if the parents are allergic to certain um, types of food items, then that can be taken into account as we do this kinds of recommendations. So I, I think there are a lot of opportunities. And our guest will derive real value by engaging with us in this manner. Great. So what kind, of, um, what kind of mistakes do you see people make when they go down the attribution path? Because presumably you've seen a lot of examples where people have made some half-hearted right. half efforts or similar. So a few different things that we should keep in mind. So first and last click is something that we have uh, talked about. What this means is that if you are having, let's say, 10 different touch points, but you're only going to count three, then certainly you're not going to get the right picture. So you want to be aware of that. Uh, the second thing to keep in mind is that you may not be able to measure every single interaction for every single person. And so the recommendation there is, can you get the right sample size that you can use to quantify these behaviors, which you can then project out for the rest of the population? And so I guess the, sometimes the mistake that people make is that they assume that unless 100% of their population is identifiable, they cannot go down this path. And the second one is that they might end up taking shortcuts that may not pan out, which is where experimentation and validation is very important. Great. OK. So love to hear. If you had three things to suggest to the audience that they should take away and do on Monday morning if they're going to be serious about attribution, what would they be? So I guess the first thing that should be common knowledge is that world is moving into more personalized experiences. So we should assume that guests and customers are going to continue to demand more personalized products, services, and interactions. Uh, that means that doing attribution and doing it in the right way will just become a requirement for us to be successful. So that is one thing. Uh, and the second thing that I personally care about is uh, as we go through this, I want to make sure that we think about what the customers and guests want and need so that we remain relevant. It's not about just driving a campaign. It's driving a longer-term relationship beyond a transaction. Great. Perfect. Well, we have a little bit of time for questions, so I suggest there will be some. Oh, I see some hands already. So let's take a few questions. Hi there. Um, would you mind talking about how the Cartwheel app plays into all of this, into the strategy? Sorry, what was the question? How the Cartwheel app plays into this? Yes, so Cartwheel app is yet another touch point that we have. That's our mobile play. For those that um, don't know what Cartwheel is, uh, that's our way of uh, providing coupons uh, to our guest, um, but that is a little bit of a mechanism by which you engage with it. So if you don't know, please check it out. But it's really a set of uh, personalized coupons or discounts and promotions and offers that we provide to you, and we certainly use personalization within that domain, and we have to take that into account in attribution as well. Does that answer your question? Got another question up here. Hi, uh, my name's Brad. I work for Facebook. Both of us have uh, companies that have tons of resources to do a lot of the machine learning you're talking about. But one of the things that um, we've focused on when we're identifying new opportunity is to pull some of the basic data, look for where that opportunity is, test it out, and then you can make the case for resources for machine learning experts, more engineers. Um, I also give this advice to people that work for smaller companies. I wanted to, could you talk to, about that more, about what you would do for the companies that don't have a bunch of machine learning experts, all these data scientists, maybe they just know how to pull basic data, et cetera? Wow. It's, uh, <laughs> it seems like a familiar path. So I also have to point out one difference that we have, which is an advantage for Target, which is that we also have a lot of domain and legacy expertise. And I want to call out legacy in a positive way. So for example, we have some of the best merchandisers um, that you can avail of. And that helps us, because this machine learning efforts are guided by the problems that we see versus trying to invent new places. So that's just a little bit of a departure from what you have to do when you're working in a domain that is brand new and nobody else has done anything. In terms of how and what advice I might have for companies that don't have those kind of resources, I think it makes sense to 
A, create awareness of what, this, what kind of value it would drive. The more awareness you can create, the better it is. There are a lot of resources. Most of you are familiar with platforms like Coursera that can turn you into data scientists, but that's not um, how far I would suggest everybody goes. Familiarity or uh, depth of knowledge always helps. But the second thing is that there are a number of different companies and partners that can start providing these values. They have a large team of data scientists and engineers that they can leverage. And the last thing that I would throw out is that Netflix conducted a very, very uh, successful experiment in terms of improving uh, the relevance of their recommendation algorithm a few years ago. And Kaggle and a few other companies uh, certainly provide that facility. And I know of at least a few companies that have uh, put out their problem and data for the world to solve. And you can certainly leverage that. Hi, right. back here. Um, I think you said early on that about 50% of your spending and marketing is traditional, I assume, offline. Um, and you do a lot on uh, television, as an example. So how do you integrate television and branding for Target into your attribution modeling? Yes, so certainly a great question. And I touched upon it uh, to some degree by saying that you don't have to have a complete sample. You just have to have enough number of people for whom you have full information about all of their interactions and exposures. <clears throat> and even in the world of television, we are moving to a place where we can follow in more detail what are the things that people are doing and watching. If that is not available, then you have to resort to a few other techniques that you can borrow from things like uh, media mix modeling to add to the attribution efforts. So I guess one is more tops down, the other one is more uh, grounds up. Yeah. yeah, but in terms of creative effectiveness, I mean, it's one thing to spend yes. a lot of money and get yes. a lot of cost per thousand, but in terms of the message, so you're asking a very nuanced question as in, what is the impact of the creative aspect of uh, the marketing or the media vehicle itself? And that's, I think, a separate question, which we have tried to measure in two ways. One is certainly we rely upon uh, really the creative aspect that we have in-house. And the second one is uh, there are a set of A-B test kind of experiments that they line up to understand what um, provides a better outcome. But again, that's, this is not different than anything that you might already be doing. You're also hitting on a problem that is um, fortunately a little bit more easily solved in the US than in Europe and other places, because you can actually buy your media by market. So the trick that I've seen and actually done in the past has been to find similar DMAs that look like they're the same in terms of the population, the, the sort of makeup, the things that they buy and you have one or two of them on for TV and one or two of them off, and then you have to track them over many months to see what effect you have. And presumably you don't mess with whatever other digital overlay you do, otherwise you won't be able to see the differences. The differences are slight, it's not easy, and frankly, it's very difficult to find an agency that will actually commit to doing anything to measure it or predict what the tail is. You have to do it yourself, in my experience. Perfect, we have time for one last question. I'm uh, just curious how you've been able to organize your teams, knowing that you're having more data science people. Are you embedding them in the different groups across your organization, and how has that changed over time in your two years? Absolutely. So there are two aspects to it. Uh, when we are trying to understand the domain and find a solution for the problem, they do remain embedded with the business or the application development teams to make it work. But behind the scenes, we are also working to improve the core data science techniques and the functionality itself. So it's, I would say at this point in time, about 70% of the work is with the business domain and the applications and maybe 30 to 40% around improving our core platform. Terrific. Well, thank you very much for your participation. I'm actually up here for another session here just now, but in the meantime, Paratosh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mina. Right.